Well, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to the first meeting of Overview and Strictly Commission we've had um, you know, live and in person for some 15 months, so quite an occasion. Um, do I have apologies for absence? Okay, welcome, David. Uh, and indeed, welcome to Councillor Sally Kenny back with us. Nice to have you again, Sally. And also Councillor Thomas Barlow joining us. Um, any declarations of pecuniary interest? There being none. Minutes of our previous meeting. Can I ask that they be agreed as an accurate record? And does anyone have any matters? arising from that. Rosie, can you just, you have circulated now the information from HR that we do request it. Good. Yes, yes. Right. Can I just say, I couldn't hear what Rosie was saying. I didn't know if it was relevant to, relevant to us all. Apologies. <laughs> um, I've circulated the notes from Chris Lee about the step-free access at Havens Road and the briefing from Liz Hammond about recruitment and the gender on data. So our substantial item this evening is um, really a, a state of the nation report and, and a look to the year ahead from our leader and our new chief executive, um, Councillor Allison, leader since November. Uh, that must have felt like seven long months by now, I should think. <laughs> and uh, our very new chief executive, uh, Hannah Doody. Uh, Hannah, congratulations and welcome from just, just a week ago. So thank you for agreeing to do this, actually. We're barely trying to get your feet under the table. Um, so I'm going to ask you to, I don't know if you've decided between you who will, will speak first, but um, each to, to set out how you see Merton in, for the year ahead. Um, I will then invite questions from members of the commission after you've both spoken, and obviously members, if you can say to whom your question is directed, and um, we'll take it from there. So, yeah. Mark. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, now, this is my first uh, commission as leader, and it's, as you say, uh, been a very strange um, period, so I'm grateful for this opportunity to finally talk in person um, about some of my priorities. Um, but first, I just want to record my thanks to Stephen after 11 years and, um, and Jed after 17. Um, I don't want my leadership to be a radical departure, um, but I also want to be very clear um, tonight about my values and where they come from. Um, I was born in St. Helier Hospital, and where I live now is the furthest um, I've ever lived from it, um, but it's still only about three miles. So I'm very rooted um, in this area, this place, um, and I'm very aware, um, really, of, um, of historic inequalities. Um, bridging the gap, um, or minimising the gap, levelling up, perhaps, um, is my top priority. Um, when I first became a councillor, opportunity for young people in parts of Merton was not great. In the last 20 years, however, that has changed beyond our wildest dreams, I would say. Results and life chances for boys and girls, in particular from ethnic minorities, have been transformed. And, and that is very important to me. One of the first things I did as leader was ensure free school meals continue to be provided. I also readopted one of the country's most generous council tax rebate schemes for low income households. And away from the council, um, when COVID hit, I helped start a food bank service with my wife and some friends. And I can tell you from my experience over this period that a lot of people are struggling um, and that that struggle is disproportionately affecting certain areas of the borough, even now. But I've also seen um, that Merton is a great community, a great place, 
and the way the community has helped those most in need has been very inspiring. The council's response to the COVID crisis as well um, and how it has coordinated the community is also genuinely very moving. Now, one of my first initiatives as leader was Merton Together. I wanted to bring communities together with the council and our voluntary sector to help get um, support to where it's most needed. But Merton Together is not just about helping, it's about including, I would say. Um, we're a diverse community in Merton. My wife and son are mixed race. Um, and um, just to um, talk a bit about it, unfortunately at Christmas, um, as many of you know, um, during the second wave, we lost my father-in-law, um, Ram. Um, Ram was a Windrush um, uh, um, uh, immigrant. He came here uh, more than 60 years ago to work at Merton Bus Garage um, and then in the NHS. So for me, um, celebrating the diversity of our community is especially um, important. And, um, and I have to say, um, I have to mention this um, because we've all been talking about it um, over the last few days, but after this weekend, with the way that um, our black footballers have been treated, that feeling of the importance of, uh, of diversity and celebrating it matters a great deal to me. So as leader of the council, I intend to celebrate our great community and all its diversity. I've appointed the most diverse cabinet in Merton's history. Um, but I have to say as well um, that, um, uh, and I'm sure Hannah uh, knows this, um, there, there still aren't enough senior managers from ethnic minorities in the council. And that's something I certainly want us to make progress on. One of the best things um, about, um, about being a new leader um, is, is getting to see all the work um, across all our departments and um, to meet and to see um, all our staff and how committed and um, what an excellent um, staff um, we have um, in Merton. Um, but with me and Hannah coming in and the changes in the way that people have been running their lives during um, COVID, um, we've thought, and I think rightly, that now is the right time to really listen to what um, residents want. Um, and that's where the Your Merton consultation comes from. Um, it's the biggest community conversation in Merton's history. Um, things have changed very quickly in the past year. People are using our parks and open spaces, our shops and town centres. They're using all the services of, um, of our area in a very different way to how they were before. They're probably relying on it more than ever. They're spending more time at home or near home, and mostly they've enjoyed it. But their priorities can't be the same as even 18 months ago. So I want to instill a culture of listening. And because we've got such a great bunch of staff, um, we should be able to listen and deliver on what people um, want as well. Now, there's a separate conversation about whether the government is going to give us the resources we need um, in order to make sure that it happens in the best way possible. Um, but if there was one way of summing up um, where I am now, I'd say that um, this is a great opportunity to listen and to change, but while still staying true to my values and our values um, as a council. But that's probably quite a, um, a good point at which to end my um, points. I know Hannah's got a lot more detail, um, but I hope that that was helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Hannah, let's come straight on to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just begin by saying, um, Chair, to you and, and to members of the Commission, um, what an absolute privilege and honour it is um, to be your new Chief Exec. Um, this is my first Chief Exec post and I wouldn't have wanted it in any other borough um, other than Merton. I have spent four years working with you across a range of um, community and housing and more recently children, schools and families. So I have a good in-depth knowledge of um, two, two of your, your departments that relies heavily on those front-facing services. Um, so just to get on record, my thanks to all of you um, for ratifying my appointment um, last Wednesday night in the height of football um, and everything else that was going on. So that was very much appreciated. 
Um, I suppose I just wanted to start by by setting the context a bit. You know, coming in as a new chief exec at this time, we've had 16 months um, of relentless response, um, a, a public health crisis um, that we haven't seen for nearly a century. And, and sometimes I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of that as we move forward and talk about easing of restrictions. We are in still in response mode. Um, the leader has mentioned it is exposed, it is exasperated, and it's just shone that um, light even more so on the inequalities and the fragility of some of our social communities. And we know that some of our communities have been harder hit than others. We know the economy has been hit, GDP is down. We know that poorer families spent more during the pandemic for the very reasons that those open facilities that you have here in Merton, the access to the different activities wasn't there. So they spent more in, in entertainment and home entertainment for their children. Um, interestingly, the richer um, uh, households with higher income got a little bit richer because they weren't going on expensive holidays or eating out. So that was quite a contrast, I think, for all of us to, 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 to think about. We know that the pandemic, um, it, um, the, the impact in Merton, we have seen more people claim out of work benefits, um, especially among our younger people. And we know that COVID has impacted on local businesses. And we know that COVID has impacted on the mental well-being of our very young, our young and, and our communities. So we're at a time where we've got a lot of things coming down the track at us. We are still responding to a pandemic. We have still got to focus on driving the vaccination rates up in Merton. That, that's our, all of our responsibility. Um, and I am working very closely with NHS colleagues to make sure we don't scale back on our vaccination sites because numbers are dropping. So we've got to make sure we're getting that message out there really strongly. Over the next couple of months, you will see already, and certainly as restrictions ease, and that is no surprise, you will see infection rates rise. So our duty as a local authority around test and trace and contain and possible surge testing um, will need to be um, a key focus and we will need to continue to be ready to respond. But there's lots of policies coming down the tracks at us and that's where Merton and my job in the first, um, that first year as you mentioned, Peter, because this is coming fairly fast. Um, and and I'll, I'll go through a couple because I think that they're quite important. The first one is obviously the comprehensive spending review. Um, and we know that's going to happen early autumn. And that's really important to us because to do the long planning and the long term planning of what services look like when we do our listening, we do need to have a period of time rather than a year to do that planning. It is very difficult when we, we have done the planning for a year. Because actually what you're doing is you're responding to what is in the here and now and not really thinking about the development and future need. We know we've got a massive challenge around wider economic recovery. Um, Councillor Allison has already talked about levelling up. Well, I've, I've levelling up is three key areas for me. The first is improving opportunity within a place and how you do that and how you do it well. And again, Councillor Allison mentioned skills and employment the use of our apprenticeship levy and how we work with businesses, how we work in procurement and how we work in our contracts. The second one is improving the lived experience of a place. The one thing the pandemic has taught us all, including the residents of Merton, is we're spending a lot more time in, at home and we're spending a lot more time in our parks and we're spending a lot more time in our streets. Um, and we're taking notice more of the environment that we live in and our expectations are getting higher. So we want our nice town centres and we want our clean streets um, and we want that those safe places um, for our kids and our young people to come together and enjoy the borough that they live in. And that is about improving the experience um, of people living in a place. So this is Merton. We want people to stay in Merton and we want them to spend their pounds in Merton. Um, we want them to be able to go on a Saturday morning with their kids and have access to different things within Merton. And that really is what levelling up is about. Um, when we talk about levelling up, it's a lot of the time about money and whether it goes up north or stays down south. But actually, when you bring it into place, it should mean all of those things for place. Um, social care reform is not going to be new to you, um, but this is crunch time because we've got a massive change across the NHS architecture. 
Now, those of you that's been around a while like me will know that the NHS goes through a number of changes and a number of restructures. Um, and I think the resilience of our colleagues, especially across Southwest London, must be noted as they go through another change. But that change has got a direct impact because it's talking about integrated health and social care systems. And we know that the system is two tiered. We know that healthcare is free at the point of entry and um, social care is not. And that causes um, a system that becomes incredibly difficult to navigate. So if you've never had experience of needing a social care service and all of a sudden you end up needing a social care service, it's a very, very hard world to navigate. Um, the cost of it is massive. And we are hoping that this time we can land it, that we can get that social care reform that's desperately needed. We, we're an aging population and, and Merton is, is, is no different. Um, children's services, we've got a number of reviews happening at the moment. We've got the McAllister report already out. We've got the SENT um, review. We've got the care review. There's a lot of reviews happening. But one thing COVID has taught us that we've amazing young people in Merton, amazing schools and head teachers and parents that kept these kids going in incredibly difficult circumstances. But they're fatigued and there's a tiredness. And we must acknowledge that and support the schools even more to deliver the best education system. Um, real concern about young people's mental health. We're seeing that surge in demand. We're seeing that rise in demand. And it's got to be a system response with schools, with social care, um, with our health partners right across the system that we come together to make sure children are supported and families are supported. We've got the Supporting Families programme. It's going to focus very much on the family unit. So not just support for the child at school, but also support for that family unit. And I think I had the pleasure of looking after children, schools and families for six months. They're in a really good place to respond to this, but the demand will increase and the surge will increase. And we, we've still got challenges within children, schools and families around the SENG reforms and the dedicated schools grant and the funding formula that's attached to that. But we're working very closely with DfE colleagues on that. Um, I, the last few I will mention to you is, you know, the housing and planning reform is coming and the, the white paper is coming forward on planning and what that means for us. Building safety, all in Grenfell, um, and of course, climate change, which spreads right across transport, housing, everything. So for me, the first year is a couple of things straight away, and certainly the first 90 days is boots on the ground. Um, Councillor Rantlison mentioned about listening. Um, I was saying to colleagues um, this week, sometimes people make a mistake when a new chief comes in, if they've worked in the borough, they think they know everything. Um, and I'm clearly saying I don't. So the boots on the ground for me is getting out, getting out into wards, talking to you and colleagues around the place that you live, the residents that you represent, and getting out into service areas in the front line. Um, we all talk about hybrid models of working. A majority of our staff worked on the front line, housing, social care, mascot was on duty 24 hours a day so it's really important to spend that time with you know our our bin collectors all of those um, critical services that kept us going they're my first priority to spend some time with them um i want to keep a focus on the vaccination i don't want to lose that focus because we've got to get the, the, if this is our way out to a new normal then we've really got to encourage and support and give the best information possible to our young people to uptake this vaccine. And then following on from the Euromart and that piece of work around resetting the vision, we're in a bit of a different world. And I don't think we can ever underestimate the impact on community decline. Our communities have suffered. Um, and we do need to following that listing and following the work of Euromart and really, really understand that deep engagement of what matters to people that live in their place and um, building that continued relationship with other partners and the voluntary organization. We've got a vibrant voluntary sector organization here. They stepped up during COVID. Fantastic volunteers across Merton from all walks of life. Great partners in the NHS and our police colleagues, fire services. And I would want to continue that relationship and build it even stronger. So we meet those challenges together. And of course, we've got to do the work around the money and identify the levers for growth and getting that economy back on track. And last but not least, and Councillor Allison has mentioned this um, when he spoke, which is of course around our workforce. 
and their resilience and their well-being and their mental well-being. They've run a marathon in the last 16 months. And usually after a marathon, you get a little break. Well, now they're on the sprint because we're, we're still responding to vaccinations and testing um, and trying to recover and get services back to where they were. So there's a real need um, to engage with the workforce to do exactly the same, listen to the workforce, listen to that lived, lived experience of what it was like delivering services on the front line, mm -hmm. building diversity to represent the residents of Merton. And I think also building capacity to meet the demands um, of what we will need to do to recover in, in the new norm of um, COVID. But I just want to finish by saying the opportunities and one of the reasons I wanted to apply for to be chief exec in this borough. I have to say this straight away, we've, we're in a fairly stable financial position. Let's not compla get complacent. That's always my message. But when you look at what's happening around us in other local areas and other local authorities, it's really a serious. It's not just about a 114 notice, it's about stopping services. And when you stop service, it impacts on your residents. And that's a public servant duty is to deliver those services to residents. There's a really strong, professional, respectful officer member relationship here across all parties. It is really strong and incredibly respectful. We've got great things to build on. You know, Councillor Allison has already mentioned, we have great open spaces. You know, the parks have been a lifeline for people. And every road in Merton you get out of, you end up in a park. I've been walking them, so I know. So we've got to build on that and really sell that as one of our assets. We've got great transport lanes. You know, we've got a tube station, Northern Line. We've got trams and, and we're not far off the M25. So what are those levers that we can talk to businesses about and trying to attract more investment out from those inner city boroughs out into um, to Merton? I've mentioned already a, a vibrant voluntary sector. It's an absolute pleasure to work with them. And I've had the pleasure of working with them for the last four years, but more, more so in the last um, 16 months. There's a real strong sense of partnership working here across all public services. It's genuine, it's transparent, and it's honest. Um, and again, last but not least, we have a very, very committed workforce in Merton. Thank you, Chair. I will leave it there to take some questions. Yes, thank you very much, Hannah. And you really set yourself some targets there. And you've got your first 90 days. Uh, by comparison, President Biden allowed himself the luxury of 100 days. So uh, that's... <laughs> um, Peter, Councillor McKay. Thank you, Chair. I think the trick is, Hannah, um, do the 100 days work in 90. That always goes down well. Um, I've got a number of questions here, but I'll be very brief. Um, I'd like to ask our leader and our chief executive, what are we going to do for the young people of the borough who are leaving school and leaving university right now and are faced with the very worst prospects uh, for a, as long as I can remember? Um, I'd like to ask <clears throat> what we're going to do, uh, and Hannah mentioned mental health amongst young people. On Saturday, I visited a, a friend that I've known from the first day of primary school, whose 16 year old son took his own life a few weeks ago. And some months ago, he had, he doesn't live in this borough, uh, but he had um, expressed his concern to um, CAMS, um, Child and Ad Adolescent Mental Health Services, about this boy uh, and they had said he's safe he's at home um, and unless and until he does something um, then we can't intervene and because he's refusing to engage then we can't intervene and I would hate to think that that could happen here in Merton I'd like to ask what we are going to do about the disgraceful state of affairs uh, in terms of our housing and Clarion, who have been for years getting away with stuff. Uh, and uh, I think the message I'd like to see is that um, we should say enough, and we are not going to accept this for a moment longer. And finally, I'd like to ask the two of you, um, what we're going to do to protect the deprived communities when our local hospital is moved away to leafy Surrey uh, and they are left with 
uh, journeys which will make it more difficult as they live their often chaotic lifestyles to access the vital services that they need. We'll probably have different perspectives on um, on all of them, um, and um, and obviously the um, the first one, um, as I said at the beginning, one of uh, the things I'm most proud of in my time um, has been that um, over the course of the last um, twenty years, um, the um, the opportunities uh, for um, for young people um, has improved um, substantially, um, but. There is a risk. You're absolutely right, um, Peter. Um, there is a risk um, that um, the children leaving um, this year and the, what they've been through um, this year puts them at a severe disadvantage to their peers um, in previous years um, and, um, and those who will follow them. So there is an onus mm -hmm. on us to work um, with all the agencies um, that we can um, to ensure that um, that they are taken um, into account, and that we do use resources like uh, you know Merton College, um, the uh, the South London Partnership to build up um, skills um, and um, employment opportunities um, for people. That is terribly important, and and it's um, you know the point that um, that I was making earlier about um, inequalities as well. We know that those opportunities are going to be disproportionately taken away from um, people from less well-off backgrounds. So it matters a lot. And there are roles for everybody here. I mean, there's roles for the, um, for the NHS um, even as well, like as we, um, as, as they, um, you know, grow their services and build um, more things they need to remember. And um, we were talking to them earlier this week um, about them needing to remember um, that they have a role within our community to bring um, young people um, with them. Um, the particulars of, um, of children's mental health, I mean, it is absolutely horrifying. Um, as a parent, it's obviously your worst, um, your worst nightmare. Um, and, um, but I mean, even if you weren't a parent, the idea of young people um, getting into um, to such a state, um, and, you know, we remember how awful it was being an adolescent, I know I do, um, but like uh, to have gone through this as well, um, what that adds. Um, and that's where um, I kind of, I pay tribute um, so much to, um, to the staff who are here for having kept the show on the road, for the teachers um, in our schools, for looking out for our children and keeping the show on the road. But as Hannah um, highlighted, um, there are, um, you know, big, big concerns growing um, amongst our school community and our social work um, community about um, what is happening. I think that we felt it all ourselves um, personally that like, you know, we got through the first year, all right. Um, you know, as Hannah said, we that marathon. Um, but like this last few months, I don't know about you, but it's felt really like a grind. Um, and um, imagine being 15 um, uh, in, in those sort of situations. And so we have to take a great deal of, um, of care with our, um, with our young people. Um, housing, you're absolutely, um, absolutely right. I suppose that, um, you know, um, it's like that old joke about, um, you know, how do you get to so-and-so? Like, well, I wouldn't start from here then. Um, well, that's precisely um, where I am um, with, um, with Karen. I think that um, um, a large part of what's happened over the last few years has shown that um, decisions that we made 12 years ago um, to, um, you know, to get involved in stock transfer and uh, the terms and everything haven't really turned out in the way that we wanted to. And now we have to be quite aggressive um, with, um, uh, with Clarion in terms of the, uh, the maintenance. Um, but also we have to work with them as well because they do operate the, um, the biggest um, estates across the borough. And it's real objective of ours to um, create better um, homes um, for, um, for, for people who are currently in terrible circumstances and then like, the, you know, the poor housing um, that they've lived in over the last um, 16 months has really brought home the need to urgently improve the, uh, the housing stock. So it, it's, a, it's a tricky balance of, um, of um, you know, uh, getting the, uh, uh, you know, the, the steel capped, um, you know, uh, boots on um, with them in some respect, but also, um, you know, giving them a, 
um, a pat on the back um, with others um, as well to make sure that the housing um, comes along. And finally, um, the hospital, yeah, absolutely right. Again, um, and, and uh, like we have to, um, we have to accept that the, uh, the, the government and the local health service are on a mission. Um, it's not a mission that we share and we'll be doing all we can to convince them even now um, that they're on the, um, on the wrong track. Um, but one of the reassuring things over the past few months, I would say, is that in conversations with um, the NHS, and I know these things go in cycles, um, and uh, you know we have to be careful with dealing with the NHS, but one of the things that has um, reassured me, and we have driven home to them, is um, that health inequalities um, has been probably the biggest scandal um, of the whole um, COVID um, period. Um, and they have a responsibility to remember health inequalities um, as, we, um, as we look to the future. Um, you know, people have died who didn't need to die. Um, you know, I think of, uh, you know, obviously I talk about my father-in-law um, and, um, uh, you know, um, in, a, in a care home that we couldn't visit um, and dying. Um, and, um, and that has happened to, um, to lots of people from less well-off backgrounds, uh, lots of people from ethnic minorities. And it didn't need to happen um, if um, the NHS and the authorities had um, acted in a slightly better way. So as we come out of this, I will use absolutely every opportunity to remind them um, of what happened um, during COVID and how it's there, um, got to be their key objective to uh, remember health inequalities. Um, I want people from uh, the poorest parts of Mitcham to have the same life expectancy as in the richest part of Wimbledon. I don't want to achieve that by making the people of, um, of Wimbledon die earlier. I should hasten to add, I want everybody to have the same um, expectancy. That's what levelling up is to me. It probably means something different to, um, to the government, but that's what levelling up means to me. And I want to remind uh, the NHS every opportunity I have that that's what levelling up should mean to them. Thank you, um, Councillor McCabe. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I think um, Councillor Allison gave a fairly detailed response. Um, just in relation to the employment and young people, I think um, one group that, that we must also remember is that we will need to work with skilling up some of our young people. A lot of our young people who are claiming benefits have worked in the hospitality and, of course, retail. Um, and we know they're two of the businesses that's been really hit. Um, so I think we've got the opportunities that we've got two key um, assets here. One is South Thames College because it's down the road um, and we've got the apprenticeship levy um, and we've got to sweat both of those first. And then I think there's a bigger piece of work that Councillor Allison mentioned that we're now talking to all of our partners around. We spend a lot of money on contracts and we need to work with our providers that every contract we award we need to think about can they offer an apprenticeship to a local young person because that spans right across a range of services so there is an awful lot to do um, and i don't underestimate in any way um, our young people that's that's leaving education or leaving higher education or indeed leaving university um, i also think we need a, a focus on our younger people our 16 year olds that may be leaving school without having the attainment of education that they need and how we encourage them around picking up those additional skills, either through um, further education or certainly through apprenticeships. So a key area of focus. To have a healthy economy, we need healthy kids. And we need them in work. And we need them to feel part of their society and, and that they're contributing to the place that they live in. Um, I think the mental health is a tsunami. Um, it, it's, I worked in mental health for a number of years. Um, and if any of you know Talbot Hospital, I was a general manager there for a number of years and managed inpatient calm services. The mental health of our young people is critical. They're our next generation. So um, every child must be taken seriously. And I think there's a piece of work that it, it, it has to be a system response, Councillor McCabe, because actually it's about us working with our fantastic head teachers and teachers and all those support staff in the school because actually it's about understanding when it's not okay. Because part of this is right now for children, it's okay to go back to school and feel anxious and nervous. They've been through a, you know, an unprecedented time in the last 16 months. And what we've got to do is we've got to train up those signs symptoms when it's not okay, when you do need the intervention. 
Um, and that's something I know our new director of children's schools and families is absolutely committed to doing and working with the teachers. Um, um, our housing situation, you're absolutely right. Everybody deserves a, a decent home. Um, I am doing the rounds myself tomorrow um, with um, um, Claire Miller, the CEO of Clarion and with council for um, Martin Welton. Um, I want to have a look at all the estates, not just our three main region estates. We've also got other estates um, that, I, that I want to take a look at. I will echo what um, Councillor Allison says. I want to build a working relationship and a partnership. It's the only way we're going to do it. So it's really important to build up that relationship with, with, with Clarion um, and then work with the residents. And I think there is a bit of misunderstanding about the actual power of local authorities or councils when you're a non-stop owning authority. Our power is actually incredibly limited. So trying to achieve this by a legal route you know, we'd be going around in circles for another couple of years. This has to be about negotiation. It's got to be about working together. And it's got to be about reminding ourselves as public servants the reason we're working in housing. And I will continue to build that relationship. And then in terms of, of, of deprived communities, I mean, I think one thing that stood out for Merton in the last 18 months is what a fantastic public health department we have and what a great leader we have in, in, in our public health director who's guided us and steered us in every way. And I know she's absolutely up for the challenge around inequalities and has been talking to me about it for the last four years. Um, so we will push for the Wilson Hospital. Um, we will also push very much as a system how we adopt and how we work towards the Marmoth principles and review, because they're principles that none of us would disagree with. Absolutely none of us would disagree with. And if we really want to be serious about inequalities, we have to get back to basics a little bit as well which isn't just about a job, but it's a nice home. It's a, it's a nice place to live. It's a clean street. It's all of those things that matter. Thank you, Councillor McKay, for the questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, and congratulations for our new CEO. And um, well, firstly, I'd actually like to uh, agree with the passion of Councillor McCabe's questions there, I, I, I echo many of them. Um, some separate questions here, maybe on the shorter term and then the longer term. Um, I've got a grave concern about, as you say, the, the COVID situation is still ongoing. Um, there are going to be new challenges. There's going to be new um, variants and the way that our vaccines interact with them. And also um, maybe even a, a bit more of a confusing picture in terms of the restrictions um you know in terms of the instructions from government i'd wonder first your both of you your views in terms of the vision of our, our principles that we hold to in terms of um safety around covid um in our community but also practically are there current pathways that are working very well that we need to bolster but maybe are there new pathways of um opportunity um to keep our community safe I'll keep my other two questions quite short. Um, moving for, further in terms of this, the resources needed to actually accomplish that, um, I have been concerned for all of my time as a councillor um, in terms of the resources that the council gets. Um, and I know that the uh, CEO might not be able to um, comment too much on the uh, political side of that so I'll, uh, maybe a, a point from our leader on his uh, perception of the government's support so far in terms of COVID but generally in local government and where he sees that but also from the CEO maybe um, if you could just summarise the main challenges in our long-term financial plan um, you mentioned the, um, the conversation with the DfE about the uh, DSG grant, um, which has especially been concerning me. Um, and then a final thing, I'm really pleased that you have had this experience with the departments that have a large um, CO, large frontline facing uh, elements. Um, and I think this has been hugely important in the COVID response. Um, so again, maybe echoing parts of the first question, um, and maybe along with uh, your Merton as well, and how you see that not just being a a single snapshot, but an ongoing process, and and maybe a a, a, re, a, a changing of how we look to communicate with our residents going forward. Thank you, Chair.
sorry, you, I'm not used to sitting down here, obviously. Um, I'll start off, um, thank you so much um, for your questions. Let me start off just around um, the uh, COVID um, and your reminder again to all of us that it's, it's, it's very much alive. Um, our infection rates are rising. Now, that's probably to be expected because we use restrictions and that's even happening before the 19th of July. Um, but I think there is two positives that I want to set out. One is, even though we've still got a long way to go, the vaccination programme in Merton is really successful. Um, it's, a, it's more successful in Southwest London, actually, than any other part of London, but particularly in Merton, we've been incredibly successful. And that's for a number of reasons. I think it's how we work with NHS, our, our amazing GPs and our Director of Public Health, but also I think the work of members here um, in promoting and, and encouraging that vaccination and getting those sites opened and enabling that access because access is key to this. We know with our young people, if you ask them to book something, it never happens. If you tell them it's just popped up and it's down the road, they'll pop along. So we've got to keep that going. That's, that's really important. Now, there's a couple of things happening that, that nobody has the answer, really, not even the scientists, and that's how these things mutate. Uh, and, and, you know, will we have another variant? But we also know winter is coming, and we know we have tough winters, especially around flu, although we obviously saw less of that last year. So I would say my focus clearly is to, is to keep going and working with partners around the vaccination. The, a big part of that, that would be the booster. Um, and I was on a call yesterday. Now, this information is still being gathered about when do you give the booster? Do you give the booster with the flu jab? And, and you know, I know scientists and, and um, very knowledgeable people in this field are working tirelessly in the background to get that program. Um, and then who do you give it to? Because sometimes with the flu jab, it can be a bit hit and miss. I've had people often tell me I went to get a flu, I wanted to get a flu jab and I couldn't find one. So we need a system that works for our most vulnerable. So that's really important. In relation to the easing of restrictions, I think our message is clear. Um, we, our job is to keep residents and our staff safe. So there's no big light switch on the 19th of July. Um, our staff has taken personal responsibility throughout all of this. The residents that has visited our building has been incredibly respectful. So we're going to continue that um, request for the use of the masks in our public places. Um, we're going to continue our staff working at home where they can while we work out our new models and our hybrid ways of working. We're going to keep our desks separated. You're going to still see the green feet and the red feet. Um, we're going to try and keep our building as safe as possible until we get through the winter. Um, and, and we will continue to communicate that with our staff and residents. Um, because of the very nature of removing some of the, the, the legal enforcement around some of this um, we're going to be very much focusing on cooperation but I would remind members that the success of testing in this borough including surge testing and vaccinations was cooperation with our residents and our staff not enforcement so we will continue that approach um, you're right about the resources it's it's a, a challenge um, my job uh, I'll leave councillor Allison go into a little bit more detail but my job is to set the tone um, and to work closely with our finance team and our Section 151 officer. We take money seriously. It's the public purse. Um, services are precious, so we've got to spend it in the right places, um, and we've got to spend it wisely. Um, and and as your head of paid service, that, that's my job, to make sure that tone um, and, and that view of money is taken seriously right across the organisation. And I, I think your, your last point is really important around... It's not just a listening for here and now. I think what COVID has taught us and what you and Merton will, will teach us is we've got to find different ways of communicating with our residents. Um, and they have to know that we, we're listening. And they have to know that services, they have a view, they have a say in how we deliver, how we develop. I, I think we're on a continuous journey here. You don't, you know, regen your town centre in, in a year. This takes a lot of time. You don't magically get housing supply. You've got to work with your place and your residents and your members um, and your workforce to deliver on those things. So I think communication is kind of be a key focus for, for a number of years to come. Thank you, Councillor Butler. So Councillor Fraser next. And if I could encourage all members to keep their questions concise. So, so. <laughs> 
opportunity to oh good thank you very much chair and thank you to the leader and the ceo ceo and i'll just start off with the ceo i do know i've i know when she first came here we took to each other probably from the same background but and i also saw her up and about around the community making sure she knew people which i really valued so I know when you tell us that that's what you're going to do, I know you will do it. However, let me get into the things that I've been writing down. I'm a little bit concerned about uh, multiple occupancies um, because they are like mushrooms all over the place. And my ward is swamped almost with it at the moment. And people are just bringing me Sunday, Monday, any day to tell me and come and have a look seven bells and one door, you know, and I have been in a couple of these and I wonder who is actually monitoring what's happening because they're like little boxes become bathroom, toilet, everything. How do you manage in that? And if we're talking about COVID and all the other infections, I am from a health background. That's a wonderful way to spread it. But apart from money, the landlords need to be spoken to and to be checked and checked all the things that we say they're supposed to be following because I don't think they're following um, any of it. Otherwise they wouldn't be multiplying as they're doing now on one road, three in a couple of months. And I'm just distraught by it all really. Um, talking about, um, employment within the council it's one of my bugbear and it is not just in this council but throughout the nation really that um, BME people are not really being given the opportunities that they should have I have sat on succession planning for many years when I first started I was asked to but it didn't go anywhere more than a tick box and I'm so distressed with the whole situation and wonder what's the point of even bothering because we're not going anywhere. So I'm hoping that we'll see a difference. I'm not expecting anyone to be put into a position as a cosmetic because that's not right. It really isn't right. Um, regarding children's services, I was really pleased that Hannah mentioned South Thames College. I'm one of their governors and I've been with them for about 10, 11 years. And each time I go to meeting, I sit on five panels and each time I go, I always say, are you working with the council? And in fact, there are four councillors from different boroughs and Merton is standing up very well, but that doesn't mean we're doing enough. Um, there are practical things which you've mentioned already that can be done. And most of it didn't happen during the pandemic because you can't teach somebody how to do bricks just by a computer you know, so brick lane, but um, it is working. And if we continue to work with them, I think you will find that we do a great job because they doing the kickstart, they're doing a whole lot of other things there. And- um, Councillor Fraser. Can I have one more? I think you've had, how many, three? No, that's two, uh, I think. Can I, I just have one I then, did ask please. you to be concise. Can I so. just say that young people, when I was at school, I used to love to go and have my Saturday job the employment law came in and such a job went out the window and that's one of the reasons why young people have nothing to do and no pocket money and so we need to i don't know how you can work with the government to try and see what can be done to get them employed they need planning they need to be part of the system before they actually start in proper work and i have a lot more but i'm not allowed thank you Thank, thank you, Brenda. Um, but uh, I'll, if, if it's all right, I'd like to just go back to a couple of other things as well in, in a moment, because um, um, let's talk about the uh, uh, the COVID um, uh, uh, response that, uh, that uh, Councillor Butler was talking about. Um, but um, I completely um, understand um, uh, Councillor Fraser's um, frustration um, about um, bad landlords, and it's been um, obviously a, a, a growing concern of ours um, over the last. 
um, 16 months in particular, as I said, because of people having to live in circumstances where they're just basically overcrowded and, the, you know, when they couldn't get out. And as she said, like, it wasn't good on health grounds either. Um, you know, it's just incubating um, the, uh, um, the virus. Um, so, yes, we do take um, some action um, against um, bad landlords um, when they're identified, but it's a hard process. And, um, you know, it's something that um, I think um, all agencies, us and the government need to take much more um, seriously um, overall. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, when it comes to um, the employment of, um, uh, of, you know, making sure, as you say, that it's not cosmetic, that we get good, high quality um, you know, excellent um, candidates applying for work here who just happen to be from black um, and ethnic minorities. That's what you want. Um, and I think that you partly get it. I don't want to embarrass um, Hannah, but if you see um, an organisation where you, if you join it, you feel you can get on, like a chief executive can be appointed from within, a director of schools and families can be appointed from within, other people can be appointed and promoted. Um, from within, you think, oh, hang on, Merton might be quite a good place to work, might be quite a good place to start my career. So, um, you know, hopefully we will start um, Merton looking and feeling more like um, the, uh, the community of, um, of London. And I've given it as, um, as a challenge um, to um, our senior officers, as I've said, to, um, to get uh, more um, black and ethnic minority um, people into, um, into senior um, positions at the council, AD level and above. Um, and um, hopefully uh, we'll be making some progress on that um, quite soon. But I will say that the appointment for both the chief executive and, um, um, and the director of um, schools and families, um, we shortlisted um, candidates from, um, from minorities. You know, Hannah is herself from an Irish community, which is like, uh, you know, maybe not seen in quite the same light now, but 20 years ago, maybe more, it was, you know, um, my wife's family's from Ireland, so don't, don't get me started on that one. Um, I, 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 um, we had some interesting discussions about the football at the weekend, needless to say, but, um, but like, um, it's fantastic that Hannah's here. Um, uh, South Thames College is fantastic. I hadn't thought about like, uh, you know, the difficulties you've highlighted about like, uh, you know, teaching how to bricklay by computer. Um, Saturday jobs is something I haven't really thought about. Obviously, I had one. Um, my son had one. Um, you know, I don't think it does any harm. But at the same time, um, you know, uh, uh, the kids want to study as well, and they want to have a um, a rounded um, start in life. So it's horses for courses, I think, and will depend on the family. But yeah, it's something to think about. Um, I just wanted to go back though to um, the, um, uh, the the COVID. Um, first of all, I'm re really um, you know pleased, and I'd like to pay tribute to Hannah and her staff. Um, we've been calling um, for quite some time for vaccinations to be offered here in the Civic Centre. Um, I saw um, Councillor Daniel Holden um, on Monday night, and he'd um, just been to get his jab downstairs. Um, it's brilliant that that service is, um, is running. It's brilliant that we've persuaded the NHS to have more pop-up um, vaccination centres and to advertise them um, and to, um, to get people um, using them. That's really fantastic. Um, that's a lot of progress, but it's not over yet as... Um, as Hannah um, said, we're a long way from having vaccinated all of the people that we want to vaccinate. Um, I'll just make a comment that's a bit political um, about the, um, the confusion around the restrictions. And I think that is a very valid point um, because I have to be honest, I speak on behalf of my mother-in-law and other people who haven't been very well. Um, COVID is not over for many of those people. In fact, what people are calling Freedom Day for, um, is actually going to be the reverse. Um, for many of them, because they are now very worried that they will go out and there will be people without masks getting very close to them in very crowded environments, and they will become ill. And they've been told by their doctors not to go out into crowded environments. They've effectively been put under house arrest again, because this hasn't been handled um, at all well. And I am very, very concerned about that. And so I will urge people in um, crowded places and on public transport to um, to um, an un unventilated areas to um, to wear your um, wear your mask, um, and the, the point about resources will probably um, continue. Um, talking about that for the second when we're here for our second time, we'll still be talking about that. So I'll leave that for another time. Um, yep, Councillor Williams. I, um, I think I need both questions and indeed answers to be concise because I've got another four questions at least, and I think we should 
take no more than a further 10 minutes on this session. Well, I'll do my best. Um, just want to revisit some of the things that have been said. So um, decent housing standards. Um, the stock transfer, which took place 12 years ago, was a unanimous decision of the council uh, because there had been two ballots. Um, but it was back in July 2014 that the cabinet uh, let Circle Housing Merton Priory off the hook um, and said they didn't need to apply the decent housing, decent home standards for 18 months. Um, and, and it's kind of the signals, is, is it not? that we send out, even though that decision was subsequently reversed in 2016, it's the, the signals we send out as a council that um, have an impact on our partners. So that's one question uh, is about signaling to our, uh, and the, the, the nature of the relationship that we have with some of our partners. On public health, question on, on inequalities and Councillor Allison mentioned the 200 bus route quandary about the, we, I think we're all familiar with the, the uh, life expectancies in West Wimbledon compared with the other end of the route in, in Cricket Green. And we get from the Director of Public Health each week, the dashboard on COVID statistics and vaccinations. Councillor Allison has mentioned this. But looking at last week's statistics that came out for vaccinations uh, but over the, of the over 50s, again, Councillor Hassan has drawn a, a distinction between various communities. White British, 92.7% of over 50s had had a vaccination. Uh, Black Caribbean, 72.9%. It isn't that they haven't had access to it. It goes much more deeply than that, doesn't it? So that's... That's a question there. Um, with regard to the communications uh, exercise that's uh, ongoing at the moment with uh, your Merton, um, which is described uh, somewhere as, uh, as being uh, the biggest community conversation we've ever held. Well, um, I'm going to just quote a leader of the council speaking about another exercise where the leader said Merton's ambition is to create opportunity for individuals and families to prosper we'll do this by binding our rich diversity of communities together with a common sense of belief in safe neighborhoods social progress and educational opportunity we want to hear as many voices as possible about what kind of place they want Merton to be and how we can better work together the council can do much but we will need strong partnerships for the private sector, voluntary organizations, and other public agencies to deliver. Now, that leader of the council was me in 2007, talking about the three month mission, to Mer mission for Merton um, uh, consultation. Uh, and that leads me into my final uh, question, which, which is this, you know, I'm worried that we're going to just get more of the same. Um, bridging the gap, is, was dated 2006. Um, we had mission for Merton in 2007. Uh, the July principles, they're 10 years old this year. Are they going to be revised? Um, Councillor Allison said that his leadership would offer no radical departure. Um, so how is, the leader going to differentiate himself uh, and stamp his authority uh, on a new vision for Merton. Councillor Williams, thank you for your question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up on, on the public health on vaccinations and thank you very much for reminding us all around the uptake. I think it again highlights actually the level of access in Merton because that is excellent percentages, um, but they're still low. 
we still can get complacent. And I think you've raised an incredibly important point. It's not just about access, it's also about good information. Um, and it's exactly the same with our young people. It's about making sure they're getting the right information um, that then they can make an informed choice. And that's a piece of work that's not gonna stop. And we're gonna have to keep talking to young people. We're gonna have to keep talking that targeted conversation to the groups we know um, that the uptake is still only at 72% because we've got to drive it up into the 90s. And I know we've got a full commitment from our Director of Public Health and our NHS to continue to do that. Um, in relation to um, the, uh, I think the other two probably, um, I, I think in relation to housing and kinds, I think I, I'd said to you one of the key ways, and, and we've got to move forward now, you know, we are, 10 years was a long time ago, things have changed. Um, but what will not change is kind of our expectations of the values we bring to the table of having decent accommodation for all of our residents, irrespective of whether it's in the east or the west of the borough. We also have people living um, in their own homes um, that's acid rich, cash poor, and spends very cold winters in isolation. So it's about the whole of the borough and keeping keeping our focus on what we mean by good, good standards of competition. Um, of, of accommodation, but I do take your point about the decent home standards, and I, I, I don't have the history here, but I understood that was as part of the the regen. If you're going to regen, you can't have both, so you 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 then um step down the decent home standards. So I do take your point in that, um, and then I think the final question, um, leader, was was, was around our communications. Do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, just um, you're absolutely correct. And um, with the uh, with the issue about homes, um, it really, uh, you know, drills to the sort of like the truth or the 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 the, the, the dilemma um, that you face um, in um, dealing with a, um, a housing association um, when you have done a um, a stock transfer and you have essentially given away um, a great deal of your powers, but you still want to have um, regeneration. Um, so, um, you know, in those three wards, uh, sorry, not three wards, in the, on those three estates, um, decent homes um, was suspended for a period on the understanding that uh, regeneration would take place imminently. And here we are, you know, seven years later, and they haven't taken place. You know, uh, that's the, um, the thing that, um, uh, that has most frustrated me um, about um, the, um, the stock transfer is that um, we can be promised all sorts of things. Um, and um, they haven't been delivered, um, and um, and that is a um, a major problem, and is one of the reasons why um, you know we don't hear about um, you know people's problems with their their housing um, because people go to um, to Clarion, and then if Clarion don't do anything about it, well, how do we know? Um, it's very very frustrating to um, to be in this situation, but we need to work together. Um, with Clarion, they can build um, an estate and build um, and increase their um, their stock. But they, if they want that, they have to work with us. They have to um, provide better standards, um, for instance. Um, and the last point, um, I know that a large part of it was uh, the political um, comments, and uh, you wanted to get your uh, your, your buzz phrase um, in at the moment. All I can say is um, that um, you should take it in some respects as um, you know, a compliment um, that, um, you know, in these last um, 14 years, I've been reflecting on what's worked well and what hasn't worked well um, and, um, and when to, um, to listen to people and how to listen to people. And um, the, the very Blairite language that, uh, that was used by that former leader yourself um, uh, may well have inspired um, me um, on this occasion. Um, I'm sure that they will come to different outcomes because the world is a different place, very different place to what it was 15 years ago. Um, but, um, you know, genuinely, I want to work with everybody um, to, um, to make Merton a better um, place. It's already a great place. I go around the whole, all the time telling people what a great community they live in and how wonderful it is. But we want to make it better. We want to make it a really good place which levels up opportunities for everybody. Um, but we do that partly by listening, and that's what we're what, that's what we're doing now. Thank you for that. I have three more members who want to ask questions, and I'm just going to make the four more members, uh, and and then we will close on this session. So, Rosie, you, we have. Sorry, Chair, can you include Councillor Kona? In right. The, uh, okay, that's fine. So these are 
if we can, please, both both brief uh, question and pretty brief answers too, if we can wrap this up in the next. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I will be brief. Um, both the leader and the chief executive have mentioned this, and I agree that Merton is a great place to live, provided that you live in a secure home. Many of our residents don't live in a secure home, and I'm sure Hannah, she might not be up to tonight, but I'm sure she could give us the uh, latest number of people who are on our housing waiting list. Um, and so I'd like to ask, and you, you've listed some of your priorities tonight, where does, the, uh, uh, where does increasing the provision of affordable housing fit into both of your priorities? And what will you both personally be doing to ensure that there is an increase in affordable homes in our borough? Thanks. Um, thank you, Councillor, for the um, question. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, we, we're a borough with the lowest numbers of temporary accommodation. So, you know, we could celebrate that, but anybody in temporary accommodation is, 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 is too high. We have got probably up to nearly 10,000 people on the waiting register. Um, so, we're, we're, you know, the challenges are there. Um, there's a piece of work that's building pace at the moment, because what we've got, and I think to reassure you, um, even though I was only um, appointed last week, we've been having these discussions for the last four weeks at, at pace now, which is around how do you address the challenge of housing supply um, in a borough where you've got real site challenges and land challenges, but that doesn't stop us looking at the options. Um, so we've got to figure out our assets and we've got to figure out what we could do with them. That's our starting point. Um, but I would say I, housing, I have a background in housing. Um, I was your um, housing need person for, for four years. Um, I saw firsthand the challenge for the housing need team to deliver that desperately wanted to deliver and didn't want to move people up and down the country, wants to keep people in Martin. So it is a high priority and work is now gathering pace. I think we need to get an understanding of the position we are going forward. Thank you, Councillor Christie. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I've got three very pointed questions. You'll be thankful to, to hear. And congratulations, Hannah, on your appointment. Um, so the first, uh, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, Ms. McLaren. So, I mean, uh, the leader has set up a tenants uh, champion, which is fantastic, and provided more information to support Clarion residents. Um, when do you both consider Clarion to have done right by their tenants? Um, so what does good look like? Um, secondly, uh, we've heard a lot over the last 24, 48 hours about flooding. Uh, what uh, discussions or steps have you taken to work with Thames Water to address these block drains? And lastly, if I may, um, you, met, you both mentioned before about vaccination rates, and it's obviously fantastic, uh, the work with the NHS, and I've got to declare a slight interest here being an NHS manager in a South East London Trust, so no direct uh, conflict of interest. But if we look back in history to the vaccination rates at the east of the borough, I've got some concerns. So how can we take this good work, good partnership work and address vaccination rates across all vaccinations rather than just COVID? Thank you very much. I think with uh, with housing, um, we all know um, what um, we all have our own view about what good looks like, um, and um, um, frankly, um, what Clarion are providing at the moment is not good. Um, so that's that's a starting point. Um, and um, but also um, in terms of the uh, the conversation about um, having more homes, which is something that we um, that we want, um, we also need to be, um, uh, be, be you know not let the uh, the perfect um, stop us from doing the good, um, if you know what I mean. Um, people are in such bad um, housing um, uh, conditions um, that, um, that having a good home um, rather than a mansion 
um, will be um, would be um, a start. Um, but uh, you know, Clarion needs to pull their finger out. We have to be um, absolutely um, honest about that. And talking of organisations that need to pull their finger out, um, Thames Water. Um, uh, yeah, on uh, Monday, um, like I know that um, sort of strange um, weather events are happening more often. Um, a day's um, right, uh, sorry, a month's rain um, in the in the space of a few hours. Um, but it is it has been happening every year um, for the last five years, I think, or so. Originally, I thought it was every three uh, the last three years. Um, we've had flooding um, in the summer um, in um, in Rains Park. Um, and we've been working with Thames Water and trying to talk to them about it, but like it is now increasingly clear, you know, they told us originally this is a once in a 50 year event, it's been happening every year, so they need to um, improve their infrastructure and we've written to them um, today and I went on the media um, yesterday um, to, uh, to give them a bit of a kicking as well. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're a very good organisation usually, we work very, very well with them, but on this occasion we feel they need to do more for um, for our residents, and we will be on our uh, the residents' side. Vaccination rates um, generally um, with COVID, I think that um, we need to um, recognise. I think that um, that the vaccination rates within groups are better in Merton than they are in mo most parts of um, uh, of London, and a large part of that is down to the hard work of our teams um, under the um, leadership of um, of Dagmar, um, Director of Public Health. So we've got to recognise that. Um, but also, um, you know, there are, um, you know, and there have been um, longer term issues around um, suspicions um, about vaccinations in the same way that, um, that myths and lies um, and bad science um, spreads um, around, um, you know, things like 4G. Um, we just need to, um, you know, to be patient and willing to talk to people, um, prepared to, um, to give information, use role models. Uh, use people like ourselves who are, uh, you know, really set within our communities to um, talk to people. And when we went around um, during the um, the surge testing, um, for instance, in Pollard Hill um, back in January in the freezing cold and snow, um, and our staff were amazing there, we built up a rapport with our community, which we can build on now um, to help people to trust us when we say to them, please get vaccinated. And, and that's part of the approach that's worked so well in Merton and why we've got better, not, not ideal, but why we've got better um, vaccination rates than other places. Thank you, Chair. You'll be pleased to know, I feel two of my questions have been sufficiently answered not to repeat the question. So thank you. Congratulations to Hannah on your appointment. My one remaining question, I has been brought up but not fully covered, is the issue of the mental health of our young people. When a youngster needs support, they need it now. And although there are very good programs within Merton and within Merton schools and for our young people, the waiting list is long and we don't seem to have enough mental health care workers to support our young people. And they really can't wait. It's a difficult situation, but are you doing anything to employ more people who specialise in helping young people with their mental health problems because it could prevent tragedies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I, say, I think the access to... In, so mental health services is commissioned um, um, by our NHS colleagues, but by our South West London ICS. And we've got one main provider across South West London and serves Merton very well, and that's our South West London and St George's Mental Health Service. Um, so there's various uh, entry points. I think that the advice and the information and the access to the online coping therapies and coping strategies is really good, and there isn't a waiting list. But we have seen cutbacks in mental health services for a number of years, um, and certainly even as a clinician, I, I lived through some of that. So there is an issue around access to beds and where those beds are if young people need, need, need admission. And the last thing you want to do is admit a young person away from home because actually part of that recovery is, is the family unit. Um, so we're working very closely and part of the work with the, the, the integrated care system, our South West London CCG colleagues, mental health and young people is one of the key priorities. Um, we have got a very high, good performing South West London Mental Health Trust but it's resources. 
it really is resources and it's something now that's really prominent because we've always talked about acute hospital care we talk about backlogs in um, elective care and we were talking to our nhs colleagues myself and the leader this week and we were saying to them actually we've got backlog of care in the community and mental health so our focus can't just be in the hospitals it's got to be about our mental health of our young people in our community as well and that's something we will continue to work very closely with our nhs colleagues on and of course our, our mental health trust who's done incredible work throughout the pandemic thank you councillor kenny if i can bring in councillor paul kohler thank you peter uh, welcome hannah uh, my question is not for you though it, it's it's for councillor allison it's a political point, but hopefully not a party political point. It strikes me we have two approaches for the next year. We could become very political, fight everything at a political party political point. And with the elections in a year's time, that's a temptation. We've already seen it tonight with fights over the stock transfer. We all know it was agreed by all councillors. Look at the minutes, it's there. If you get into that fight, you only help the Liberal Democrats because none of us won the council at that point. So let's stop that fight. Likewise with St Helier Hospital, you've lost that fight, Labour, move on. And, and as someone, I was born half a mile, or I, I lived my formative years half a mile from St Helier Hospital to the age of 20. Great staff, we hated going to that hospital because it was so deteriorating, the building was so horrible. We used to hope to go to Epsom. So that was my experience living half a mile from St Helier Hospital. Now, rather than that, Rather than, that, rather than fighting these things, can we in the next year, given the huge, huge pressures on local government, and despite the election in a year's time or so, can we please work together? And Kaza, Alison, I want to give credit to you. You've started well. We've, we've pushed you, or we, 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 we pushed and pushed about a, 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 tenants, a tenants champion. You accepted it. Aidan, I can live with you saying the, the leaders brought that in. I don't mind. What I'm pleased about is the fact you listened to someone else. And Councillor Frazier's point, this is the point I want to make to you. For Since 2018, we've been pushing you on, on licensing for tenants, for, for landlords. We've pushed you on a selective licensing scheme. We've tried to prioritise it in our budget amendments. We tried to get a scrutiny task group on it in 2018. It was always pushed back. That was the previous regime. You've started well, Councillor Allerton. All I'm saying to you is, please don't assume all you know everything and what we say is simply there to make political points. Let's work together to fight the problems we have ahead of us. Thank you. So probably the, uh, the fun answer here would be, be for me to say that, that I, I do know everything and, um, and I will do it my way. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think you can tell from, um, from my first uh, eight months um, that that isn't um, really uh, my, my style. Um, and um, I'm slightly amused um, that, um, that actually quite a consensual tone um, within, the, um, within the room um, and, um, and a willingness to work together for um, the, uh, the benefit of, um, of the community seems to have transmitted itself to, um, you know, down the, uh, the, the Zoom line um, to the Liberal Democrats' home um, as being, uh, you know, big disagreement, so, which I don't think has actually been um, the, um, the case. Um, and yeah, you're right, if we talk about things like um, stock transfer, it was a decision that, um, that was taken after um, a, um, a public ballot. Um, and agreed by um, by the whole council, um, but but now um, twelve years on, we're probably looking back and reflecting on and going, well, maybe we would have done it differently. That doesn't mean that uh, that we're having knockabout um, about it. It just means that um, that we're reflecting in a grown up way um, what has has happened. Um, I mean, I don't agree with you. I have to say, um, when it comes to St Helier, that's the one thing. Um, I don't think that um, that we should just um, say we've lost move on. Um, I think that's the, um, the wrong approach. Um, first of all, I don't think that we've, um, we've lost. I think the battle is still on. Um, and I think that um, the, um, the, 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 the need to tackle health inequalities um, gives us the opportunity to, um, to work with the, uh, the government and, um, and see whether they will um, reflect on it. And I don't agree with you as somebody who also lives within half a mile of, um, of St Helier. 
um, that it was regarded in such um, low self uh, low, low esteem. It may have been for um, for some people. Most people in the area love it. Um, many people know um, family members who've been born there or whose lives have been saved there. Um, and um, you know, I, I put myself into the first of those categories, um, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for um, for what it's uh, provided for my community for um, a very long um, time. But irrespective of, um, of St. Helia and all of those things, if we all work together, as you say, we will persuade um, the government and the local health service that we sh um, should get the, uh, the health service that our residents um, deserve, that enable life um, expectancy to raise in areas where they're low at the moment. Um, yeah, you mentioned landlord licensing, and that's obviously something that we're looking at. Um, there's also problems with that around resourcing as well. Um, and that's just the environment that we're in, um, unfortunately, and have been in for, um, for some time under austerity. I know we haven't talked about austerity a great deal tonight, but it's still um, an issue um, for us and has been um, ever since um, 2010 and the change in, um, in government then. Um, but it, it may well be that, um, that after um, COVID, there'll be another return to, um, to austerity to pay for COVID. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that some um, communities like ours will be able to um, to grow back um, stronger. And I agree with you that um, that if we all um, work um, together, um, I, I say after our experiences last week of um, of trying to follow the football, um, I'm a little bit uh, jaded um, when uh, with things like that. But I'll say no more um, about that. But I look forward to working with you together on other things. Maybe. Um, looking forward to the other uh, football fixtures in future to make sure that they don't clash with council meetings um, ever again. Maybe that should be the council's pro top priority. And my leaving point tonight, um, football is more important um, than life or death. There you go. Had to get that quote in somewhere from well, the, Bill, Bill Shankly. Yeah. Um, Councillor Barlow, this is the last question. Thank yeah, you. Just quickly. Um, so you both mentioned listening a lot. First of all, welcome and thank you. Uh, you both mentioned listening a lot, um, think, and obviously embarking on this sort of listening exercise that's, that's begun now. Um, in the past, from resident surveys and just from, from speaking to residents, I think that the council's track record on, on acting on, on those listening exercises hasn't always been seen as the, as the strongest, um, or where there's been consultation exercises that residents feel that there's been a sort of big weight of opinion on, on one side and then the decision's been taken on the other or, or similar on uh, for planning matters. Do you think the council's record on listening and acting on that listening has been good enough up to this point? And, and what practically do you think can be done to, to improve it? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that. I mean, I think there's a, um, there's a, um, a risk with anybody who works in um, in politics, um, but the people that you listen to are the people that you speak to, and the people that you speak to are the people you want to speak to, um, because you're hoping to hear from them um, in the way that um, uh, uh, you know you're hoping that they'll tell you what you want to hear, um, and um, and there there is a risk of that for um, for all of us, and I'm hoping that um, this um, your Merton exercise will help uh, will help overcome some of that and ensure that it, there are representative voices. Unfortunately, with consultations, and I know what you're alluding to, um, in certain cases, you have to act within the law. Um, the law might be an ass, um, but it's an ass that you have to um, obey. Um, so, um, you know, we have to, um, um, to act in those things. And also, um, we have to, um, to listen to um, a sort of a wider, you know, the, the old silent majority um, and recognise that, um, you know, over things like housing, um, there is an incredible demand out there for um, for more housing, and if we only ever listen to the you know uh, the, the organised groups that are against um, new housing, um, then um, then people will suffer. Um, you will have um, you know less um, of a say over organisations um, like um, like Clarion um, because um, the possibility of them building and the need to work with us over that will be taken away. Um, so. Um, I, I totally take on board, um, board your um, point and I aspire um, to be a listener, but I suffer from the same weaknesses as you and everyone else in this room, that, um, that I like listening to people who like me and it's harder to listen to people who don't like you, um, but I have to listen to, um, to both. I, I can't believe there are people who don't like me, um, but um, I, I need to listen out just in case there are any. 
Well, I guess it hasn't quite been as bad as a hearing before Congress, has it? But it's it it has. <laughs> but I, I think we uh, we have questioned you for longer than any previous uh, <laughs> uh, you know, introduction to the year from from our our leader and chief exec. So thank you for bearing with that so well, answering so thoroughly. Uh, we do appreciate it. We do, you know, we do genuinely wish you every success for the the year ahead and hope you will come back in a, a year's time and, and reflect and tell us how it all looks then. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so um, our next item, the recovery and modernization program, fine words, I don't, I'm not too sure what they mean, I think this is our, our, our chance to find out. So we have hopefully Chris Lee and Frank Dick and I'm going to come down there so I can see their presentation. Chris, when you're ready, please feel free to start. Yeah, thanks. I'm just looking for it on the uh, on the dashboard on my uh, desktop. Sorry, one second. Okay, hopefully um, members can see that. Uh, do shout out if you can't. Uh, I'll assume you can. There are only um, five slides here, so we're not going to bore you with too much PowerPoint. Just to remind members that this came up at your last overview and scrutiny meeting when I think in talking about the Equalities and Community Cohesion Plan, uh, I referenced the work that we were doing on recovery and modernization and volunteered to come along. Uh, and I'm grateful to Frank Dick, who's the interim uh, recovery manager, for also joining me because Frank is uh, much more deeply involved in this. And I'll ask Frank to talk, particularly when we get to slide five, which unpacks the components uh, of the recovery and modernization program and gives you a bit more detail. But I'm just going to talk through the origins, firstly, uh, of the uh, recovery and modernization program because they go back not just to the start of the pandemic, um, which has had a big impact on the work and the, co the components in this program, but go back to the internal review, which is probably three years plus uh, ago now, uh, and then the LGA peer challenge. Uh, those informed us all really about what the council needed to do, particularly around technology uh, and some of the work that we needed to do to improve customer contact uh, and use digital solutions to improve that and to improve the efficiency of the organisation. Those were also added to with uh, the change programmes that each department has developed over every year uh, and in the past few years, looking at how they uh, make efficiencies and improve uh, services. Uh, and again, some of those were about digital solutions, but some of them were about uh, commissioning, uh, procurement, uh, relationships with communities and uh, with the voluntary sector. 
and then last but not, not least at the bottom, if you like, one of, if not the only uh, benefit that's come out of the pandemic has been our awareness of the fact that we can work very differently uh, and not least the working arrangements around staff working from home, uh, using technology differently, uh, and our relationship with the voluntary sector, uh, which has developed during the pandemic and has informed uh, a lot of the work that we have within this recovery and modernization program. So that slide sets out the genesis of this program. And uh, Jed Curran, the previous chief executive, uh, right at the start of uh, the pandemic, or probably two or three months in, as we shifted immediately to a different way of working, uh, as part of CMT, we uh, reflected on how we would work. Uh, and uh, some of this work was undertaken by a, a previous board, an internal board called the Merton Improvement Board. We decided to bring all of the cross-cutting cross uh, programmes that we had and bring them right under corporate management team every Thursday. So an additional corporate management team to oversee the response to the pandemic uh, and the programmes and work streams that you'll see uh, within, this, uh, within this presentation. So this slide, um, sorry, I've jumped across the slide. Um, the, the, the program has these three broad uh, connected objectives. So firstly, it is about uh, developing uh, and embedding the opportunities and benefits evident through the experience of responding to the pandemic, uh, reimagining, rethinking and redesigning the operating models uh, with the overall objective of, of delivering improvements, efficiencies and savings uh, and a better customer experience. Uh, and you'll see that that is uh, part of the, the approach that we're taking. It is within existing budgets, I'll just stress that. So this isn't about uh, new money being applied. There was a budget set aside uh, under the management of the uh, Merton Improvement Board uh, and that's been put together uh, alongside other uh, funds that, that have been set aside for these separate work streams in order to deliver the overall programme. Uh, and this, as I say, comes under the governance now. Whilst there are individual projects, the overall programme comes under corporate management team meeting uh, on a Thursday afternoon. And each of the work streams that we'll come to shortly uh, has a corporate management team sponsor, so a director sponsor. Uh, who acts as the, uh, the lead uh, sponsor for, for, for these individual projects. So this is quite a, a busy slide, but if you look, if you work from the bottom up, uh, it really just seeks to describe the, the architecture uh, and the, the, the themes and the approach to delivery of the, the work streams that we'll come to on the, the very next slide. Uh, and with Frank uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll run through those. Um, and that uh, Frank's post provides that extra capacity to help coordinate this in a way that we haven't, we haven't had that before. So this has been a real boost in terms of being able to, to, to make progress here. Uh, and the, the, the bottom component here, the cross-cutting developments, all of the, the projects and the work streams affect more than one department and most of them uh, affect all departments. All of them require uh, corporate capacity, whether it's IT or HR or, or procurement. So they are all uh, cross-cutting in nature. Uh, and you'll see that when you see the components or, or the work streams. They're all about uh, either service redesign, um, and uh, that's about, in some areas, integration with community services and looking at, at different approaches through early intervention, working with the voluntary sector. Or they're about, and this is a large part of the program, digital approaches and using new tools uh, to provide efficiency using new technology. Uh, and some of them are a direct response to COVID-19, particularly around home working. Um, it is about integration across different parts of the system. As I say, some of them cross more than, all of them cross more than one department, uh, adult social care, children's social care. Uh, and there are reframing of the relationship with the voluntary sector, with, with residents uh, and with communities and business. And those are uh, the overarching themes. 
So getting to the, the, the meat of it, really, there are 10 work streams uh, that we're working on. Uh, I'll talk about uh, two or three of these where I'm the, the sponsor, starting with, with your Merton, which I, I won't dwell on too much. It's been referenced a number of times this evening. Uh, and I hope members are familiar with that programme, which is uh, well advanced at the moment uh, and is a, a direct response, at least in, in part it was referenced in the, the LGA peer challenge, uh, but it was in particularly uh, highlighted and accelerated as a consequence of, of the pandemic to better understand uh, our communities. The, the, the work streams two and three uh, are both digital programmes uh, and one, the smart working is about uh, home working in effect. That's about, that was the direct response that we had when uh, the Civic Centre pretty much overnight went from 1200 people to on a daily basis, sometimes no more than 100 people. Uh, and we had to, within the space of uh, days, uh, shift our operations to people's living rooms, bedrooms, back rooms and so on. Uh, and over the last 15 months, that's consolidated uh, and a recognition that we won't return to anything like the pre-pandemic uh, ways of working. And that's required a significant change in uh, where technology is based, uh, and that's, that's to the home, uh, and uh, changes in uh, the staff working arrangements, uh, and a, a plan now to move towards a hybrid working arrangement where our buildings are used for different purposes, uh, not necessarily for staff to come in and work Monday to Friday. Uh, and this offers us the opportunity to be able to release uh, accommodation, office accommodation uh, in the medium to longer term. And that sits alongside another, another digital programme, which is about uh, mobile working for those staff who a large number of them in my department uh, work both at home, in the field and in the office uh, and assessing the needs for the different kits that those staff have uh, and how that can integrate with the back office systems so that they can work more efficiently, whether they're planning staff, uh, building control staff uh, or neighbourhood client offices working in public space. And one uh, application which we're just about to procure, which has been through uh, through an assessment uh, proof of concept, is Fix My Street Pro, uh, which will um, significantly improve the ability of our staff to be able to operate, uh, identify defects in highways, in public space, uh, waste collection, uh, street cleanliness and so on, uh, to be able to improve the connectivity to back office systems uh, but also information for customers. Uh, I'll talk about the fourth uh, work stream and then hand over to, to Frank to talk about some of the others because customer contact um, was a programme that the council began really in, in 2016 when we embarked on a, a, a contract relationship with General Dynamics and we made some progress with the council's CRM system. Uh, in improving the customer interface and the way in which customers could, could order, uh, could find out information uh, and could um, request services, particularly again in my area. Uh, that came to a bit of an abrupt halt in 2018. Uh, and this is a recognition that phase two now needs to, uh, to commence. Uh, and the design of that piece of work uh, is is advancing uh, at the moment uh, and will also include uh, some testing proof of concept around fairly advanced technology being applied in other authorities uh, around chatbots uh, and the use of software robotics uh, to use algorithms in order to be able to process frequent, regular, high volume service requests without human intervention, but to be able to allow customers to be able to access services uh, 24 hours a day uh, without needing to talk to a member of staff uh, if that's their, their preferred uh, method of, of service provision. I'll hand over to Frank, he'll talk about some of the other uh, programmes in the work stream and then uh, happy to open it up for, for discussion. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I won't spend too much more time on this, uh, so it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour around the rest of the programme. But just to start with maybe a couple of general observations. So picking up on the uh, observation at the beginning from the chair, what, why is this titled Recovery and Modernisation? That, that is actually a very deliberate badging of this programme, uh, and it really reflects both the fact that there's a clearly a strong and necessary focus on uh, the impact of the pandemic on the on the borough, uh, its communities and its residents, and how, as a council and an organisation, we respond to that and work with our partners to respond to that. Uh, so the obvious uh, component around that is the impact on the local economy and local jobs and local businesses. So I fully expect that what we will see coming through uh, the Your Merton engagement uh, and the other engagements that are underway, uh, a very strong component that relates to those economic impacts. Uh, and then the question for uh, the council and its partners is, what can we do? What are the levers we have locally that we can um, apply to start to resolve and tackle some of these uh, local issues? Um, uh, and the other observation I'd have is that in terms of the modernisation part, this is really in some ways a continuation of the journey that the council has been on, I think, for some time. So, for example, Chris alluded to the customer contact work that was undertaken uh, probably around 2016-17. A lot of that work uh, has progressed uh, and the organisation has made reasonable progress in a number of these critical areas. But I think there's a recognition from the corporate management team uh, and indeed from the new chief executive that the pace of that needs to be increased. And I think maybe the ambition of that needs to be uh, increased as well. Uh, and obviously that also links to uh, and is very strongly connected to all the recovery considerations that we expect to see uh, that we are already aware of, but we know uh, will emerge over the next few months and indeed years. Um, so just to say a little bit more about some of what might look like more internally focused uh, parts of the programme, so around the ICT review, the HR operating model, procurement data and intelligence. Um, whilst they do clearly have an internal focus and they are about the, the machinery of the council, nevertheless, they are quite critical uh, to that ambition uh, and the sort of change that the organisation needs to be thinking about and putting in place. Uh, so if I start with the ICT review, because that really is a key one. So uh, we commissioned uh, an external consultant to come in uh, and uh, run the rule over where we were in terms of our development, particularly around uh, digital development and the maturity of the organization related to digital technologies and digital applications. Um, and on the back of that, we commissioned some further work to start helping us think through uh, what sorts of digital approaches and solutions we might need to be working on and implementing. Uh, and that really is critical for both the organization uh, and how it works and how it can work much more efficiently and much smarter. But it's also critical, of course, to the service that we provide to residents, communities and businesses. Because if we're not doing that digitally, and indeed, if we're not giving uh, our residents access digitally in the way that I think increasingly they expect. And indeed, I think all of that was accelerated through the pandemic when largely the only way for a long period we could ever interact with um, businesses or organisations was digitally, remotely. Uh, it's, I think, highlighted how significant uh, this digital agenda is. Uh, and I have to say the organisation needs to uh, do much more around that. And I think we need uh, we've got a lot of ground to make up, but I think some of the uh, initiatives and work streams you see in the programme are starting to put that in place. So that ICT review has been quite critical, uh, and we're now running an exercise which is about assessing uh, the capacity and skills we have in the organisation, what we re require in the organisation, or we have capacity and skills to deliver a more ambitious digital agenda. Uh, and on the back of that, I'm sure there will be proposals then to put in place a different new operating model for the ICT service and indeed the way the whole organisation approaches and thinks about ICT uh, as a set of tools 
uh, to support delivery of, of frontline services. Um, in the same vein, I think procurement commercialization is there to start testing uh, our ambition around our approach to procurement. And indeed, there's some quite potentially strong connections to the way we work, for instance, with communities and local businesses to promote local employment, to promote those local businesses, and to generate the sort of um, uh, community wealth and community creation that can support uh, and address some of the economic impacts that we're seeing coming through, um, through from the pandemic. Uh, in terms of the data and intelligence, that's, uh, that's really there as almost like an underpinning part of the overall arrangements that we need in place. We need to much better understand uh, our residents, our communities, uh, and have the sort of level of data and intelligence that allows us to take a much more sophisticated and developed approach uh, and in the way we think about uh, and work with those communities and residents. And that's really what the transforming our work with communities is very focused on. It's not the, it doesn't really convey an awful lot that title, I have to say, but that's very much, and I think um, Hannah touched on this in some of the comments she made, that's very much about how we join up across statutory organisations, but also with the voluntary sector and the community sector to create much more joined up, integrated approaches uh, to the way we uh, support and respond to residents and communities. And as an illustration of the significance of some of that, we know that, for example, through the community hub that the council set up uh, as part of its response to the pandemic, uh, we were dealing with something like 6,000 plus uh, uh, individuals and families that weren't known to the statutory services. Uh, and I think that gave us a, a real sense of the scale of the challenge in terms of those individuals and families who are not necessarily in the statutory system. Uh, and indeed, the idea of this piece of work is very much that we get support in at an early stage such that they don't need to then move into the statutory system. Uh, and I think certainly for me, that's a critical piece of work. But if we can get that right, I think that will uh, deliver some very substantial benefits, both to the council, its partners, but of course also to residents and communities. Uh, and indeed, that's one area of work that I think, uh, and we're, we're testing this out in one part of the organisation, working with partners. But I think if we can get this right, and we've commissioned, uh, uh, again, some external design input to help us with that, to develop our thinking and develop, develop our knowledge around these sorts of approaches. If we can get that right, then I think there's a real opportunity to expand that out across certainly the whole of the health and social care sector and probably even beyond that. Uh, and that data and intelligence piece, again, very much plays into all of that. Um, Couple of them final uh, observations. I mean, there, there are of course a lot of linkages across all of these work streams. They aren't uh, entirely separate and independent of each other. And part of the job of, of myself and the team with Chris uh, and the corporate management team is to make sure it's all connected up and it's all moving in the same direction. Uh, and of course, data and intelligence will be critical to the your Merton piece. We need to understand and have a baseline uh, of information that we can then uh, monitor as we progress through. The other important and final point I'd make is that um, this is all very much about delivery. Whilst we do have a lot of plans that underpin all of this, the key for me, uh, and I think this is, this is certainly uh, where the organisation is and where corporate management team is, that this has to be about delivery and about real change, both within the organisation, but of course, then ultimately uh, within the borough. Uh, and I think your Merton uh, and where we take that in terms of delivery is going to be critical in terms of uh, both shaping the strategic ambition that the organisation has, but also that strategic direction of travel over, uh, I would say, probably the next five to 10 years. So I hope, Chair, that's given you uh, and your colleagues a, a sense of the programme. Uh, it was very whistle stop. Uh, and obviously, I'm happy to come back if you want further information. I'm happy, of course, to answer questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Frank.
Chair, with your agreement, I'll take the slides down unless members want to keep those up for reference. I'll take those down, Chris. Thank you. Um, questions for either Frank or Chris? Paul, Paul Collab. Thank you. That was very interesting. I, I was trying to get you to keep the slides up for a reason, but don't worry. Um, that was very interesting and it's very exciting. Now, this sounds critical, but, but bear with me. If you look at that first substantive slide you put up, you had these various inputs. One input that wasn't there was anything about councillor or political input. It's very interesting, Frank, when you talked about talking to about communities, at no point did you mention councillors as representatives of the communities. Is that because one, you don't think we have a role to play in this? Two, is that 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 just or secondly, that 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 ability is not there or that resource is not there? Or three, our role is a subsidiary one, just to help you communicate what you're doing. Because I would have thought, given what we are as a local authority, us as representative of the community, we should be one of the inputs in that strategic vision. And I don't see that in your plan. So perhaps um, I'll respond to that initially and Frank may want to add something because I think the, the brevity of the slides probably doesn't illustrate the complexity. Of the uh, and of course, the, the genesis of, sorry, there's quite a bit of feedback, apologies for that. Um, the, the genesis of the programme, uh, as the first slide showed, was from the internal review, the peer challenge, uh, and from departmental programmes all of which have a significant amount of community and political input. The departmental change programmes, for example, uh, seek to reflect the, the commitments and the priorities of the council, as well as the department's connection with communities and the changing demands and requirements for those communities. Uh, and that was played out in the peer challenge and the LGA review. So I think in our brevity, we haven't... Um, clarified exactly the fact that this is informed by the political machinery that we work to uh, and by the community needs uh, that are constantly informing all of our service plans and the annual business planning round that we go through. If you remember, Paul, the, the target operating model that we used to operate uh, was deeply embedded in a, an evidence-based assessment of uh, the communities that we serve. Uh, and uh, that, that informs our regular uh, service planning process to this day. Yeah, oh, can I just come back to you on that? Do you remember the point I made three years ago to you that the Toms was, was working on a five-year cycle that completely ignored the four-year cycle of, of, of politics? But that's a minor point. All I'm saying is not so much politicians saying tying something off at certain points it's not that it's actually us in a non-party political way being representative of our community telling you what our communities are saying about what's wrong with the, what's wrong with the provision we we've, we've got to be part of that input into what we need to do to change to make our provision work in my view i am looking at our, our work program but with a view to making sure we do have a, a an opportunity to look at the your, the results from your Merton. Um, yeah. Let me let me come to um, Mansour. Your question, Mansour. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chrisley, for the comprehensive information. I just need to know the biggest challenge of COVID nineteen pandemic for recovery and modernization program. Thank you. I suppose the, the biggest challenge for, for me as a director uh, has been the immediate shift to a completely different way of working where I could get up from my desk and go uh, one floor up or one floor down and talk to my staff uh, and be able to uh, discuss the services. It, it's that shift to a very different way of working now, which is hybrid working, as we call it, uh, where staff are working from home. Uh, working in the field uh, or working in the office, and that's by far the minority. And that happening pretty much overnight tested our, our digital capacity uh, and 
over the last 15 months has tested our approach to staff management uh, and health and well-being. But it has delivered significant benefits and will deliver significant benefits in terms of work-life balance and also the opportunity to realise savings uh, as we reduce our footprint. Not just savings financially, but savings in terms of carbon uh, and our commitment to the uh, the climate change emergency. Mm. I don't know whether Frank sure. wanted to add anything. Yeah, just a, a couple of things. Uh, in, in terms of the, the longer term, well, the first thing I'd say is I don't think we have yet seen all the long term impacts. And I think those will still become more and more evident over the next months and years. But for me, there's two, I think, that particularly already stand out. The first is the impact on the local economy, uh, jobs and businesses, and, and that's undoubtedly, we're already seeing that. And I think the expectation must be, and indeed you, you hear experts talk about this already, that as government withdraws support to business, uh, as it un unrolls the, um, the pandemic support, I think we will see an even greater and more severe impact on the local economy and indeed the regional and sub-regional economy. Uh, and the other big one, and I think you've touched on this in the early discussions with the chief executive uh, and the leader, is the impact on health and well-being. Uh, we know there's already quite strong uh, adverse impacts on young people, for instance, uh, on black and ethnic minority communities, for instance. Uh, and again, I think we're going to see that become more and more evident over the next few months. Uh, and, and, and the thing that strikes me about that, and you know, we've talked uh, for many months about how unique this is uh, as an experience in a set of events, I think we are going to start seeing some unique uh, and very serious impacts. Uh, but as I say, I don't think we've seen the entirety of those yet. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris and Frank. I'm just wondering if in IC review, ICT review, um, I've worked here for since 2010 and I've had nothing but nightmare regarding my laptop. Keep changing things, having to ring up. And I'm just wondering if all of these things will be upgraded so it helps us as counselors to do our job uh, more effectively, please. Do you, do you want me to start, Chris? And yeah, please, thank you. Yeah, so in fact, I think I think there are some very um, practical and, and important considerations around how members work and how members have the digital tools so that what well, they can work more efficiently. And uh, I, I take the point that the fundamentals are that your laptops work to start with, but I think there's some other uh, tools that we should be making available to members. Uh, and I've had some very initial discussions with um, uh, with other officers about the potential to start giving members those tools. Um, it would actually be really useful for me to get a sense from members here about how receptive you would be to that, uh, because I'm sometimes told that members wouldn't really want to or, or get uh, get grips with uh, digital tools. But I, I'm not entirely sure that is the case. Uh, and certainly from your question, Councillor, it feels to me like you are looking uh, for some more efficient uh, and smoother ways of, of, of working and doing your job as councillors. Just, just to add to, to Frank's response, I think uh, the ICT uh, work stream, Brenda, um, is a response to particularly the uh, LGA peer review, which, if I can summarise it fairly poorly, uh, suggested that the council was pretty good at keeping the day-to-day -day systems operating, but not as good as it could be about the sort of long-term blue sky thinking around ICT. So we could keep the network operating and repair the machines, notwithstanding your comments about your laptop. But the council wasn't great about thinking about what does what does a smart city look like and what's the council going to, how's the council going to fulfill its digital responsibilities for both staff and the public in five to 10 years time. Uh, and that's the area that's, that's really pressing us. And that's why the council with Frank's support engaged Agilisys to do some work around what's the model we should operate and what sort of capacity do we need uh, to help us with that? Not just the day to day, but the blue sky thinking to help our managers to envision 
uh, the applications that are available and that some other boroughs are uh, utilising in order to try and create the, uh, uh, the, the borough of the future. Thank you, and I look forward to that. Looking for, for the questions, I don't see any at the moment. Rosie, none? No. Okay. Um, can I say that it is good news that we are going to revitalize the, uh, the, the CRM program because at present our, our website, when I recommend residents that they should go on to it to find things, can be embarrassingly clunky and it would be good to have something that moved a little more slickly and easily. So that, that, that is good news. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, otherwise, I think we now do have a, a better idea of what's going on. Um, and yes, from the peer challenge, I do, do remember there was a certain criticism about a, a lack of uh, ambition at some levels in, 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 in Merton's approach. And uh, you, you've addressed that, I think, Chris. So we, we look forward to that. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to close on that. Chris and Frank, thank you both very much for, uh, for the presentation and, and for giving your time to us. So our next item is to identify questions for the borough commander. Hopefully she's going to come and see us in, in person. Yes, that's, that, that'll be good. Uh, in fact, we'll be meeting her for the first time, won't we? Um, and we do want though we do want written answers this time. So in fairness, I'm asking that you do submit your questions by the end of this this month. I don't expect it necessarily to happen tonight. But if, if you can make sure that Rosie has them in the next two weeks, uh, uh, we can then reasonably insist on, on written answers. Okay, with that. Um, can, we, can we just have a, um, a reminder of that, say, to our group offices or to members, um, if that hasn't already, isn't already in your thinking, it might be, but... Uh, otherwise, I think these sort of um, deadlines kind of just get missed. No, we will uh, put a reminder through group offices. Um, and the other item, <laughs> excuse me, remaining is the is the the work program. Um, and I've already mentioned that I do want to ensure we we find space to uh, scrutinise your Merton when it's coming back um, as all the results have been tallied. We, we, we've got that on the radar, haven't we, Rosie? Yeah. I have started discussions, Chair, with, um, with the policy team. So the results of your Merton are still being collated and they're going to LSG in September. So I've been given a provisional date of November for it to come to the commission, if that okay. will, if that will okay. fit in. Yeah, yeah, fine, good. Otherwise, any other comments on the work program? No. Okay. So I'll, I'll draw the meeting to a close. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, safe journey.